mind, we are just looking at relationships, not just marital relationships, but just family relationships, you know, parent, children, um, other family members, just how we relate to each other. And so we're looking at, we're going to start a presentation just looking at the impact of black history on our relationships. I'm going to ask Andre, please, to put up the PowerPoint, not this one, the other one. Sister Lily, Sister Lily, impact, impact of love. It's not on. It's not on. The screen is not on. And I want the PowerPoint. The black and white PowerPoint, that one. Good. All right, so I'm supposed to be doing this presentation with Brother Greenland. All right, I'll go ahead. So the impact of black history on relationships. And when we think about black history, we're often looking at the experience of blacks in America as um, beginning from slavery until today. I need the PowerPoint. I have this already. I just need a PowerPoint. You don't have to put up the word, these words. All right, so some of the words that, what are some of the words that come to your mind when you think of black history? Slavery. Mistreatment. Chains. Chains. Timbuktu. Zimbabwe. <laughs> Oppression. All right, so. Canfield. Nelson Mandela. All right, so a lot of things come to our minds when we think of black history. And for some people, you know, it makes you bitter. Um, I don't know if some people will ever be able to get past the anger. But I believe that we have come a long way as black people, and we can't change our history. And even though, you know, a lot of things happen that we don't necessarily like, but we can use that to empower us as we move forward. All right, so... Black history, mistreatment, I don't need to describe that. Subjugation and subservience. We know that blacks were enslaved, they were under total control of white, and they had to be obedient, or you know what. Um, and then we are also going to look at systemic racism and what that has done to us. You see um, inferiority, loss of respect, and autonomy. Next slide, please. Sort of, we're looking at systemic emasculation and the contribution to black male dysfunction. And the four main points that we'll be looking at are slavery, education, religion, and racism. So we're looking at this from a systemic standpoint. All right. So, slavery. And this, there's a book called Saltwater Slavery. The author is Stephanie Smallwood. And she describes slavery as an acute blow to both, and we're looking at a black man, both his sense of self and manhood. And it says for the African male who prided himself on being able to protect and defend his wife and family. Longer, no longer able to function according to his developed self-concept, he became psychologically bereft and awash in a sea of shifting identity. If he could no longer function as a man, then how should he function? But more importantly, what was he? So intense was this psychological shift as to induce deep depression. Not hearing me at all? So intense was this psychological shift as to induce deep depression and psychosis, sometimes leading to even death. Some men threw themselves from ships, droning themselves in the salt waters 
of the Atlantic Ooh. Sea before they could be recovered by slavers or slave owners and others. Mysteriously, it was said, they will themselves, some even will themselves to death. Daniel P. Black in his book, Dismantling Black Manhood, describes it as the slave's initiation into a systemic degradation designed to strip away his humanity and make him ready for the seller's block. Black states that men who once stood in defense of their mother's and father's legacy, now under extreme duress, simply sat down and died. They saw little reason to live, for their manhood had been rendered dysfunctional. He could now look to none but his master, the one to whom the system had committed his entire being, the man upon whose will depended his food, his shelter, his sexual connections, whatever more success was possible within the system, his very security in everything, in short, everything. All right, so emasculated, not to be confused with demasculated, which is not a word. What was left of him? So uh, just imagine, all right, so he already went through this um, struggle and now he was being literally emasculated. This was a shift from internal to an external um, power control or, or, or struggle. Having physical features and psychological functions, but denied the role of manhood. All right, so he had, still has his physical features, his physiological functions, but could no longer function as a man. You know, he, he was denied his role. So loss of sense, loss of sense of self, sorry, loss of manhood, and shift from internal to external support. Next slide. Next slide, please. We're going to racism, and very short. According to Daniel Black, freedom was not synonymous with equality. And so, yes, we're f black man freed, but he was not allowed property, property, not allowed to vote and denied citizenship. And you know the rest of the story with, with racism there. All right, so we come down now to education, which is the next slide. So the best way for a black man to secure his manhood was thought through education. And the concept of black manhood seems to be rooted in the male's desire for respect, autonomy, and agency. Black, again, uh, says that, uh, what's that? Uh, the miseducation of the Negro. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or not to go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it if you control his thinking. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, there is, if there is no back door, he will cut one out for his special benefit. His education would make that necessary. Right, so we're going to jump to religion. And uh, there's one text, Ephesians 6, verse 5. And that's, all, all, that's a text that's used to validate or to justify slavery. And it says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. And as I said before, it was used to justify slavery. All right, so imagine for a moment that you were stolen from your home, stolen into slavery, chained, placed on a ship, and brought to a strange land. Imagine losing your manhood, stripped of your identity, and robbed of your dignity. Imagine being, being nothing more than mere property, used as a stud to impregnate multiple women so that the master's wealth would increase by selling your children to other plantation owners. Imagine being stripped naked and then beaten in front of your so-called woman and children. 
Imagine your mother, your wife, or your sister being raped in front of you while you stood powerless to defend it. This was what it meant to be a slave. Everywhere the black male turned, he met a law, an institution, ideology, or individual that functioned to remind him of his inferiority, disallowing him agency, autonomy, or respect. Think of this sentence for a moment. What were or are the consequences? Could it have been that it's these impacts of slavery, racism, and systematic emasculation that are lingering today? Could it be that some black men are still struggling with the role and identity issues? Could it be that in an effort to reclaim respect, autonomy, and control, black men misunderstood or have difficulty embracing a strong black woman? Could it be that their understanding of a submissive woman is warped? Could it be the reason that some black men have children with multiple women without an emotional attachment to either the children or the women? Could it be the reason that black men are more prone to getting a black women are more prone to getting a degree than our black men? Could it be the reason there's a higher percentage of black men among the prison population? Could it be the reason that black children are more likely to grow up in a single parent home? Could it be the reason that the divorce rate amongst black is the highest? Are these problems unique to black couples? So I want us to identify some of the root causes of our problem, problems since acknowledging them is the first step towards finding any solution. So a lot of these problems we blaming on the system. I, I, this is saying that they are systemic. How then do we fix them in our individual homes? We're going to take the video and then we're going to have the panelists. They're going to come up and we have Jackie. She's going to be our moderator. Thank you very much. And I hope that you ponder these questions. Line up, everybody line up. We're about to race. Everybody line up. 
Shoulder to shoulder. Take off your backpack. Basketball, line up. We're about to race. Hey, we are we are racing for a hundred dollar bill. The winner of this race will take this. A hundred dollar bill. Before I say go, I'm gonna make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was gonna come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly gonna win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. You didn't learn anything from this activity. You're a fool. Happy Sabbath. Let me try again. Normally, I would say that was practice, so <laughs> <laughs> that's warming up. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, welcome again to another very interesting and I'm hoping informative session here at Margate Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're so grateful that you're tuning in today. And as I sat and listened to Sister Greenland, I heard some very interesting, yet what I would consider very heavy material. So we're going to try to break it down and try to have a very informative discussion. So the takeaway will not be anything negative because here at this church, you know, we're always 
about being positive and how we can move forward forward as we strengthen each other. I'm Jacqueline and I will be your moderator and I will just allow each one just to introduce yourselves. Sure. Uh So my name is Chad, and uh, this and we've been married for five years. But I don't know Vanessa to introduce herself. Happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Vanessa. I am the wife of Chad. So I'm Vanessa Hines. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm Taji, and I'm single, and I'm just here to observe and put in my point. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Haitian Walker, and I've been married for 11 years. My and husband's in the audience. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paula Thomas. I'm the wife of Mr. Thomas. We are married for 29 years. I'm Garfield Thomas, and in August, will be, it will be our 30th. This year is our <laughs> actual 30th. Not but we have been friends for 36 years. Amen. Thank you very much. And we would also want to use this opportunity just to welcome everyone on Zoom. Thank you for, yes, thank you for tuning in. And we're coming live from the Margaret Church. And we also have a couple that's coming in via Zoom. So at this moment, I will just give you the opportunity just to introduce yourselves as well. Sure, sure, loud and clear. Okay, so I am Marsha Bailey, and I'm married to this gentleman for the last five years. I am Richard Bailey. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. So at this moment, we will be talking about black love. Now, I know that once we're talking about love, romance, sex, relationship, anything to do with black and strong, it's, it can get very heated. So my job is as I sit and I listen <laughs> to this informative and heated discussion, then I will be here just to keep things in check, moderate, and just make sure that we don't get too hot in this place, okay? Right, right. <laughs> so I will just um, allow you each to just share what's on your mind, anything that's burning, anyone. All right, Jack, you don't want to share your credentials too, because I know you're trained in this type of thing, right? Yes. In this type of thing. <laughs> this type of work, right. Yes, I have like over 15 years experience working with couples. I'm a trained counseling psychologist and my emphasis is in marriage and family counseling. I've taught at the university for over um, four years, just training counselors, teaching counseling classes and psychological um, courses. So this is what I can do in my sleep. All right. <laughs> All right. Amen. Yes. Thank you very Thank you much. Very so much. I, will so I will just give you, give you the, the opportunity, opportunity just to, to share, share any, burning any burning issue that's issue. on your mind. Thank you. Is, is, is anyone? We're having a feedback. Someone just turned their device on. Okay, go ahead. Hello, hello. No, um, Sister Jackie, I got some questions from Brother Greenland earlier, so I don't know. Right, but before we get to that, okay. like as you think about black love, black history, and as you listened to Karen, is there anything that's outstanding that you would want to just? What I would say is when black love is done right, beautiful things happen. All right. All right. All right. All right. That's a good start. <laughs> that's a good start. Anyone? I have so I want to share also that as we saw, can you hear me? Sure, yes. I want to share also, um, like we saw in the video that they, they just showed the one with the race. Um, as black people, when we decide to um, start a family or start a marriage, 
we need to um, make um, a concerted decision to, to up our game and do better than the generation before. Because we're coming so far from behind that it is so important for us to make sure that we're purpose in our minds to do something better than the generation before us. I'll give you for example with myself and my husband. We came from homes where we didn't have fathers. And uh, I purposed in my heart that I would not create my children. And he, I think he, he came into, uh, we came into this thing with the same kind of purpose. So, you know, as we as we go, um, you know, further in the generations and, and thinking about uplifting our races, we have to be so purposeful in ensuring that we shift the paradigm at every, every, every generation so that we can get further ahead in the race. Thank you so much for sharing. That's so true and um, so important that we should do better as we go forward. And right now we're going to delve deeper into talking about. Oh, excuse me, you wanted to share? Okay, I just want to share. I just want to share a little information. Um, my mom and dad, my, my mother is a maroon, she's very dark. And my father is fair, whatever you call him, brown skin, fair skin, light skin, whatever. And um, I learned that we are originated from Scotland, which is Browning is my maiden name, B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G. And so when I was a child growing up, I wish I was darker because I was being ridiculed that you're red like mango crab. And yes, and being older now and see how a lot of persons bleaching, I'm like, what? No, I can embrace my color because I wanted to be darker because of how persons perceive me. For instance, a dark person might enter the room or wherever and, oh, she's tush and they wouldn't want to talk to me. Because think that I was like here. And you know, I was I wish if they could understand who I am and learn about me before they, you know, withdraw from me. That's what I want to say. Thank you so much. And we can all learn from that, that before we judge. You can't just look on the color or the skin tone and make judgment. That's so wrong. So we are here to learn and we are here to grow. And it's okay to pray and ask for forgiveness for the past as we move forward. So now we're going to delve deeper into loving a strong black woman. So the question, the question to everyone is, when we talk about a strong black woman, what, what comes to mind? If you should give a definition, what would you say? Anyone can respond. Like, who is a strong black woman? I would say, all oh, black women are strong. <laughs> I am in agreement with that. <laughs> Anybody else want to say something on that? <laughs> a, a woman that is um, purposeful, um, as we we'll say, that have, have, have their heads straight, uh, you know, know, know exactly the direction in which they want to go. So in all aspects of their lives. Thank you very much. That sounds like having a deep sense of purpose and understanding what they're about. Correct? May I add, may I add that to answer your question, Sister Jackie, as racially, we have endured and still continue to endure so much suffering and oppression on different levels. And we can go back to the introduction from Sister Greenland and Brother Greenland. So a strong black woman would be somebody who, in spite of the struggles, in spite of everything that will rob you of being conscientious and having good problem solving skills and making good decisions, you're able to overcome the struggles and be resilient and learn how to, you know, we say one on book of a basket, learn how to take your hand and make cash when you don't have enough, how to make that enough for your family and keep your family together in spite of all of the obstacles that we face. Thank you so much for sharing. That's a very good definition.
also when I think of a strong black woman, usually they're you know seen as independent, I work my own money, I don't want to be disadvantaged, so you tend to want to take care of yourself, you never want to be in a position where you are taken advantage of. So um, I see a lot of, you know, some men might not feel attracted to a woman like that because they feel as if, um, what's my purpose here? If you think you are, you know, the all and you can do it, do it all, what's my purpose? So, yeah, you know, I see men shy away from these women because they're normally educated, they're normally Strong. well taken care of, they, you know, so um, some men see it as a negative thing. Thank you very much. Men, are you going to just sit and let this pass like that? <laughs> I also wanted to add, Slide. when we talk about the black struggle, um, as, as a race, the black man has been the black man has had a lot stacked against them, and almost, um, almost as though the black woman was invisible. So it, 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 it's, it's stacked against the race, but the, but the black woman was even further behind. I mean, we, we probably, um, you know, don't have a lot being meted out to black women as, it, as it's meted out to black men, but in terms of coming up and all, only, um, you know, only your, your, your thing, a black woman is coming from further behind. So in order for you to get ahead, I really stamp your class as a black woman, you really have to like bring your game. So, you know, that to me is a strong black woman, someone who is, you know, holding their own, um, being ambitious and, you know, passing all the hurdles and, you know, um, being successful. Thank you very much. So, I would say for the strong black woman, I mean, in our Caribbean society where we're growing, we have a lot of single parent. So that's that single black mother who is raising the kids on her own taking care of them on their own and doing everything. It takes a strong black woman to cover that role. And what I would say is that that women, I would say, looking at statistics, statistics not so recent, but in, when you look on the major universities, especially in Jamaica or in the Caribbean, most of the persons who, persons who matriculate at university are women. So nowadays, if, if, if a gentleman wants to in a relationship, when they're in their twenties and thirties, they will have to to be in a relationship, or it's it's hard to not be in a relationship with someone who is professionally trained, who has a bachelor's degree, so on and so forth. So that is just another example of how women are, the black women are strong, and that uh, and that uh, nowadays most women are, are are professionally trained in in some way, shape, or form, and not to take away anything from those women who are not uh, university trained or who have an advanced degree. Thank you very much, Brother Greenland, you have. All right, so I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around the terminology, strong black woman. All right, so I understand what we have said that, um, you know, the woman who we call strong has the ability to balance a lot of things. Now, based on the introduction, it seems to me that it isn't that the woman is strong, it's usually that the man is weak. Hello. Right? Very so, 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 he, uh, so even with the point that you just made, that those who are matriculating, those who are graduating in numbers are the women. So is it because they're study harder? Is it because they are stronger? Is it because more women are leading? Is it because more women? Is it that the woman has a certain disposition that there that suddenly that it's now more women graduating? The the point that was made online was that women are coming from a place of nothing. So you know you know women usually long after men were seen as property, women were seen as property long 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 after that, right? And they were not given certain liberties, um, the voting and, you know, these are all these rights that, that were first granted to the men. So my question is, this is my question, I'm, 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 having, I'm struggling with the thought. When we say strong black woman, and, you know, we, we even made mention that of a single parenting where the woman had to do certain things in the absence of the man. Are we referring to a woman being strong because 
the man is weak? That's my question. Thank you for the question. I was waiting because I know that we were going to, <laughs> we, were going, we were just warming up. Everything okay. that we said before, we were warming up and now we are getting ladies ready. First, ready. First. Everybody want to say something now, so ladies first. You really made a good point because it's almost like these women have to pick up the slack. Because, two roles because the men are not there and you know, statistics show that women, black women, are the last of all races to get married, the first to get divorced. So black women, they're looking and they're saying, I have no one to depend on. I really have to be strong. I have to make sure I can work my own money and do all of these things because our men are not marrying us and they're not taking care of us, they're not fathering our children, they're not staying. So they have no choice but to be strong. All right, let us um, pause a little bit. We have to pause here because we want to be clear. So remember, we are seeing some men, you know, those that are not here. Those are the ones we're talking about. Right, right, and we are, we are married. So we are saying some of them are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? We just have to be very careful. Yes, but um, so as we're going slowly, we're just making sure we're sending the right message. So what I'm hearing is that what we're considering to be strong, we're talking about women who are resilient, yes. independent, yes. powerful, yes. and confident. Yes. Anything else? We're just talking about women, they have a strong mind and also great trust in God. Exactly, yes, yes. And what I would say is some, some men enter the workforce earlier because families want an income. So they'll ask that the, the, the man start working maybe after high school and maybe that's, that's what's contributing to fewer men being in universities. So that's just a consideration. Okay, that's a good point, but two persons online, okay, I will give them the opportunity to speak. So I think that, you know, in order to have a balanced perspective, we should also give a place to talk about the strong black man, because there are many men, and we, you know, from the introduction, we see that we all enter this life at a deficit, and there's so many men who themselves have overcome so many hardships, and they are great fathers, great husbands, great leaders in the community, great leaders in the church, and they're model human beings. So I think to you know to make a balance, we need to also have that discussion, and not so much men against women, but looking at from both perspectives, how do we define a strong black man? Because that's also beneficial for our young men in the congregation. Because in order to encourage certain behaviors, we need to recognize it and affirm it. And if we want, as a generation, male and female to move forward um, successfully, we need to accentuate the positives of both genders. Thank you very much. And that's exactly where we were going. And as we go along in the presentation, that's something that's coming up that we have um, for discussion. Next slide, please. There's another person on Zoom. Yeah, uh, Ms. Marietta, I, I have a question, however. Brother Fenton. Are you hearing me? Thank you, yes, we're hearing you, loud and clear. Yeah, the, the, the question I have, because Sister Walker mentioned about uh, a wife who may be much better off than the husband financially or even education-wise. Are we speaking about Christian or are we speaking about woman in general? All right, we just, we just want to make an announcement that anybody who has something to say on Zoom, just go ahead and say it, so that because we, we won't always be able to acknowledge the hand. Just go ahead and speak when you have something to say. Okay, I don't remember Hello. saying. Hello. Hello. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, Sister Black, hold one moment, Mr. Walker. I, uh, I don't remember saying anything about 
the woman making more money. I was, you know, making a comment about all these women who are considered strong and the fact that they, a lot of them are doing it because they feel it, there's no choice. They have no choice. Um, because, you know, we do see that we have inherited broken families. We have not, we're, we haven't inherited families that are good examples. Many of us, it's, it's, it's the statistically proven that many black families are broken and um, all of that. So these men have not picked up the slack. I'm not saying it's for all, because I'm married, I, I love my husband, I have a great relationship, so I'm not saying it's all. But what I'm saying is that a majority, majority of women have to pick up the slack, and that's why they have no choice but to be strong. They have no one to depend on. Yes. Hello? 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 Yes, Sister Black, it's your time now, go ahead. I guess it's technology, but go ahead. Yeah, but I, I, I've been trying to come in, but um, I don't know if it's... Hello? Okay. Could I say something? And sure. You come sure, go ahead, go ahead. I'd just like to applaud Sister Dawn for her comment. You know, uh, very commendable sister Don, that we should balance the program because for a minute I saw that it was strong black man, we black man against strong black woman. So, you know, we need to, you know what I'm saying, balance the program. Thank you very much. It's very balanced. Just that we were planning to talk about women first and then the men after, but thank you. It's very balanced. Let's Good point. Before we, I'm, I'm sorry, I wanted to say something before we moved on from this topic. Um, I just wanted to put a little different perspective. I hope I don't shift the topic too much, but um, just want to kind of give the strong black woman mantra a little bit of different perspective as to the fact that it can be a little bit, I don't know if problematic is the correct term, because um, there was a study that I was reading on actually that shows that this repetition does have a, a more negative effect on a black women's state of mind because when you are expected to be strong at all the time, it can lead to more uh, like anxiety, depression, things like that when you don't necessarily match up to that perspective at all times, you know, when you do want to be softer or you don't necessarily fit that independent uh, viewpoint or sometimes even in outside world, other people automatically look at you as strong and then they see that you don't uh, feel pain as much and so that can go into a whole bunch of different things. So that's just a different perspective to put on there. Sometimes it is necessary, but it also can lead to um, things when you put that onto yourself at all times. I'd just like to comment on that very quickly. Um, Elder Fenton, I was part of a question earlier. I, don't, I didn't hear it answered as it relates to, um, are we talking about relationship in the world or are we talking about the church? The church. Women in the church. Okay. I'd just like to say that it's everywhere, not just in the world. One, and I'd like to piggyback off what Tiana was saying. You know, growing up, I've always been told that I should work harder than everybody else because when I get out there, I might not find a partner who will pull his weight to, and my children cannot be disadvantaged. And even in college, you know, I'm in nursing school, when I'm doing my clinicals and so on, I have a black teacher, let me just put that out there, I've been told that I cannot afford to slack off, even if I'm not, or appear tired or anything, because I'm black and everybody's gonna look at me like, wow, she can't do her job just because I'm black. So that has given me a lot of anxiety in the past and it truly is a problem, just like what Tiana is saying, because we cannot at all times be strong, be energetic. So I'd just like to say that. Thank you very much. Just agreeing on. So can I be a strong black woman, as in a successful woman who, 
you know, achieve, have you know, a high achievement, but still want to be pampered, want somebody to open the door for me, the car door for me, and love me. I want some TLC, not because I'm strong and black. Doesn't mean I want to be by myself doing everything for myself. All right, let us just um, go over that because that's very important. So what you're talking about, we must remember it's Black History Month, number one. Number two, we are saying that the strong black woman is someone who is independent, confident, educated, and also trust in God. And we are making it clear that we are coming from the positive perspective. We are not discussing this as something negative. We are also saying that it's okay to be strong, and it's, it does not mean that you don't want to be pampered and loved. We are just making those things very, very clear. And know what we are going to do, we are going to discuss how can a strong black man love a strong black woman? Because that is the essence. That's what we are talking about. We are talking about black history. Hello. We are talking, hello, just one moment. We are just setting the foundation and the stage so we understand what we have said before, where we are coming from and where we are going so we don't just beat the air. Understand? So the intro, hello. Just one moment. So the introduction from Sister Greenland, she spoke about history and slavery and what happened. And we want to see if there is any impact, any connection with what happened in the past and what is happening now and how we can correct that and how we can build ourselves and go forward. That's the essence. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Hello. Yes, go ahead. We can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, this is Sister Black. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, Sister Black. Okay, what do you think of the one? Sister Black, hold on, Sister Black. Oh. Sister Black, you have a lot of noise in your background, so we can't take your call. We can't hear you. I don't. Well, you have a lot of noise, so we can't hear you. Okay, Sister Black, we are having noise in our background, so we are going to ask you just to hold on. We'll get back with you in a moment. Thank you so much. Sister Black? Okay. Go ahead, Sister Black. We are listening. It's a forum and you're allowed to say something. But what we are saying, we are trying to listen to you, but we are having a feedback. Okay. Thank you for understanding. Christian women, we had answered earlier. Christian women. Thank you very much. Christian women, thank you very much. Christian women. Yes, yes, yes. Continue talking. And if they had exactly like that, 
Yes, yes. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Okay, that's what you're talking about, the strong black man and the strong black woman. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to give my panelists. One moment, one moment. We're going to have the panelists. They're just going to discuss how they believe that the strong black man can live successfully with a strong black woman and vice versa. So go ahead after you, then we'll take the panelists. So just to also um, validate Tiana's point, a feature of being strong is also knowing when to ask for help, to say I'm struggling and I need help, and to advocate for ourselves, uh, because it's important that we, and, and, and or allow ourselves to cry, and practice self-compassion and self-kindness. So there are many different qualities of what would be defined as a strong person. So I'm glad that Tim had brought that to the fore also. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you. Thank you, Sister Dawn. And I, I, I'd, I'd like to add to what you're saying. I think it's important to define what a strong black man is. And I think that I think the definition has to do with how we seek help because all of us face conflict and obstacles in life and it's important what, what's important is how we manage these conflicts and I think in for men I think there's oftentimes there's too much of a focus on our physical strength and our prowess with the ladies and our charm and how much we earn and how we look and I think that's a downfall for many of us men and I think the more successful men are the ones who, who are humble enough to seek the Lord and to seek strength from the Lord. Because, I, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure when you're in high school, university, chat, how come you're not going out? How come you don't have no girlfriend? Things of that nature. And you might find that those quote-unquote nerds in high school or college, they end up being successful because some of you know some of them would have sought the help of, of the Lord and to submit himself to the Lord and then that leads to success. So I think the definition is important. Interesting, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Now we're going to just um, delve in some discussion questions and the first question is how can you have a successful marriage? given that all that you have said, how can we have a successful marriage with a strong black woman? And we will leave that to the mayors to answer that. <laughs> all right, let me take it. So I have a couple of points here, right, that I put down. I just want to say first, you got to put God first in that marriage, Amen. making God the center of that marriage, because without God in that marriage and being in the center of it, it's going to fall apart. Excellent. I want to say my second point here, I have the trust. Okay, it's very important that um, we have the full trust, and that goes both ways. Uh, I have finding quality time, quality time for your, for, your, for your partner, and of course, most important, communication. Thank you very much. So that's, let's go again, communication. So my four points, I would say trust. First, put God first, trust. Um, finding quality time and the communication. Excellent. That sounds like excellent information for a book on marriage and family therapy. <laughs> Very Thank good. You. I agree. I agree. And but that, for full disclosure, that's my daily struggle. Communication, quality time. So communication, quality time, trust yeah. in God. Communication. 
How many times? It seems like we could um, memorize that or just keep going over. Yeah, Communication, right. yeah, right. trust in God. Yeah. Very powerful, profound. Thank and you. And quality time, very important. Quality time. But what, what really is quality time? I mean, we're, we're all in this day and age, we're also caught up with work and busy. You know, you have to find that special time. I mean, if you have a family, like if you have kids. So when is the husband and wife time? You know, is it only when the kids are gone to bed? Or do you find other time for like, for if we go on vacation? So finding that extra additional time and not just differently from your daily routine. So additional time for the couple without the children. But it's done to me, like you're saying, you should use a calendar and use a calendar to say tonight or tomorrow night. It, I'm not sure no, that's not what you're saying. No, not necessarily, no. Okay. No, you Fair. just, it's supposed to be flowing naturally. Okay. <laughs> Vanessa. Oh, I just wanted to second everything that Brother Thomas has said before. And the first thing he mentioned was, you know, having trust in God. Which is very important in modeling that in our relationships. Because if we think back to how we define a strong black woman and also a strong black man, you know, one of the characteristics of these individuals, they seem to be pretty much self-sufficient, right? You know, it would seem as though there's really nothing else they need. But at the same time, you know, there's everybody talking about how they want to have someone still open the door for them and, you know, things like that. So it's good to remember that, you know, in terms of how we relate it to our relationship with God. Because God doesn't really need anything, right? But he does ask us to love us. And that's why he gave us choice to do these things so that we can show him that we love him. So in the same way, you're relating to a strong black woman or a strong black man. We always need to remember, you know, remember persons, not necessarily even weaknesses or needs, but just the way that we can connect to them and with them to deliver things that really make them feel, you know, really special, really loved. Thank you, Vanessa, because we are all about love. But is it that we are saying that the woman who is not confident, not uh, educated, like with formal education, are we, are we saying that that person is weak? Right, and that's actually something I was going to get to. You know, the, def the definition I gave about what a strong black woman is, is what people perceive it to be what the world says a, a strong black woman is. My definition is different of what a strong black woman is. I, I mean, yes, I went to college, I have my degrees, my masters and all of that, but I, 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 I stay at home, I take care of my kids, but I still consider myself a strong black woman. So, you know, I, you know the definition is important. I think there's more to a black woman than how much money she works, and how um, all of these things that society says she is to be strong. I think strength of character is yeah, also, yeah, show, it shows so much strength in women. So um, we really need to kind of figure out what we think a strong black woman is, what God's definition is exactly. for a strong as black woman. As Christians, thank you so much for clearing that up because there are so many women with PhDs and as a, as a counselor, most of these women have been abused. So are they strong? Are they weak? They have, they, right, so what I'm trying to say that it doesn't matter. Being strong has nothing to do with your education. You can have 10, PhD, be, 10 PhDs and you're, very weak, you're not strong. So we're talking about being strong in the Lord and being strong in character, okay? We're clear? <laughs> All right. So how can we have a successful marriage with a strong black man? Oh, we, um, also with women, I think it's important to get to know each woman individually. Because some women, I have spoken to women and it's gifts. They like gifts. So each woman, each woman is different. Our husband really needs to get to know his wife what's important to her, and give that whatever it is, pamper her wherever she needs to be pampered, but truly listen and figure out what your wife needs. So are you, are you saying that it is possible to be living some, with someone for five years, 25 years, 
and you still don't know the love language, you don't know what they want, you don't know what they need? Is it because Absolutely. of lack of communication? What could be the problem? Because some men um, get, they receive love a certain way. So they might receive love by words of affirmation or quality time. So they give this quality time back to the wife or words of affirmation, which is good. But um, there's also other areas that a woman might need this affirmation in that the man might just not know. The woman herself might not even realize that these are her love language. A good way to find out what her love language is is to figure out what she's doing for you to show you love. That's usually her love language. Thank you very much. Well, I think that one thing that we can take away today is that each person should be able to say, my love language is, and you should communicate it. I know that I love gifts. And if you're going to do acts of service, if you're going to wash the car, clean the house, I am not hearing I love you through that because I want money and gifts. That's what I want. And I'm going to tell, I am going to tell you that if you're not giving me what I want, I don't know if I'm coming across as strong <laughs> or too strong, <laughs> but that could just be like an example. <laughs> I'm going to say, I know what I want. And I'm going to work for it. I work very, very, very hard. So it might come across as a joke, but too many people sit down wanting something and not asking for it. That's the point I was trying to make. Can I make a point here, um, Sister Jackie? On, you know, continuing on the same thought, and you were asking about what could be some of the problems. I think one of the problems is stereotyping. The same way we may stereotype the role of a strong black woman or a strong black man thinking that you know they don't have any other needs. So that could be one issue. And another um, side of the stereotyping is where, okay, I'm married to a woman. Um, you feel like every woman likes roses, right? So it's not just about the fact that they like flowers. What if she doesn't like roses? You know. So it's always important to get down to the nitty gritty of the specifics of what the individual That's what I'm appreciates. To right. Thank you so much for making my point so clear because I specifically remember one female telling me that I don't like flowers. I don't like flowers. I don't like roses. And I'm not going to tell you what it is that she wanted. <laughs> uh, I think the point is you got to get to know your partner very well. For me, as it, as it relates to gift, I know my wife is not fussy about gifts, not at all. So even if, if Valentine Day comes and I don't give her a gift, I know it's no problem because she is not like that. So it doesn't take us, I mean, she appreciates whatever I give her or when, but as it relates to gifts and all, and you have to get her this and that, she is not like that. And uh, you know, it's been like that for 30 odd years. So I, I know it's not gonna change. Very good, and now we can see why they have made it to 30 years. There you go. So let's take, let's, let's, so let's look and learn. So Sister Jackie, quick question. So you recommend or read in the book uh, for the love languages, Gary yeah. Chapman? Yes, so yes. For, so for the, for like, for persons preparing for marriage, people engaged, you recommend it, right? I recommend it. You don't really need the book. You can also use the internet because this is a foundation. Of, this can be the foundation for a successful marriage, just knowing how the person hear you say, I love you. They may hear I love you through gifts. They may hear I love you through cash. And nothing is wrong with cash. <laughs> they may... They may... <laughs> They, how unfortunate it will be if all they wanted was $50 and you kept on buying 1,000 red roses. I know you get my point. Yes, um, I want to clear it. My husband give me gifts, but it's, <laughs> it's not that. Yes, I, it's not that. You know, some people, they're looking forward. It's Valentine, you're looking forward. I know he's going to bring me rose. Oh. But if he didn't bring me any rose, I would be okay still because he'll do it another way. Um, when it was my birthday, you know, the other day you went out. And I was wondering, what is he doing so long? <laughs> so when he get back, he said, you think you'll get me today? <laughs> so he bought me a watch and some other things. I appreciate it very much. I was surprised. But um, if he, like, take me to dinner or something... I'm okay with that. It's not that. 
I want the expensive gift. I am not in material things. So, so, so your long love language would be acts of, um, what's that one? Service. Acts of service. Yes. Yes. That's, that's your love language. Thank you very much. But another important point that we can, we can take from this, if you have a love language, let's say lover for those who love cash. What is, no, it's only fair that if your partner is spending all this time to do acts of service or to buy you roses, you should also appreciate it. Don't just stay there and say, that's not my love language, I need to, don't, no, we have to be fair. You can communicate by saying, I appreciate it, but at the appropriate time, when you're having that quality time, it would be a good time to say that I feel loved when you give me gifts, okay? I agree. I agree. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, uh, just, to, just for clarification purpose, because we're talking about love languages, and some people may be wondering, what is that? So there are five love languages as um, put forth by the author. Words of affirmation, physical touch, quality time, acts of service, and receiving gifts. I'd also like to add that in order for us to understand love languages, it goes right back to the basic foundation that I think Brother Chad mentioned earlier about communication. And from a historical perspective, as a race, we were not taught quality communication. If you think about it, how did the slave masters communicate to our forefathers? They beat them, um, you know, it was it was just really brutal ways of communicating. And then we come into this world not really being intentional about learning quality so communication. Have, and I was reading a research earlier that shows that communication is a big factor that causes the breakdown in marriages. Because sometimes we struggle to have the difficult communication which are most necessary without getting the emotions involved where it becomes so riled up and it becomes a conflict instead of problem solving. So it's so important we understand that there's passive communication, there's passive aggressive, there's aggressive and there's assertive. And that we identify and understand that the use of assertive communication is the ideal. And going back to the Bible, it's where in James we're told that we should be slow to speak and we should be quick to listen and slow to anger. That is quality communication. And we have to be very intentional about that in all relationships. Thank you very much. So, so as we go, that's a very profound point to take with us, that we're going to communicate intentionally. And we'll just wrap up now. One moment, because we're almost out of time. So we're going to allow another panelist just to also speak briefly on some of the solutions that can help us to build stronger homes, stronger families as we go forward. Okay, so today I will be speaking on submission. Usually, you know, growing up in the church, we've always heard about women submitting to their husbands, but we've never heard about what the husband's role is when it comes on to, you know, the submission thing. And usually our definition of submission means that somebody is forcefully put under the authority of another person. But we should know that in a Christian marriage, it means that you give support to your partner, you give a lot of respect. And I think that our men submit, even though the Bible says that women should submit in the home and so on, men submit differently and they should submit differently. And the way they should do that is through self-sacrificing love. Um, the Bible says regarding the woman as a part of his body. Um, you know, I like to think about it as, yes, the man is the head, but what good is the head without the body? No good. They need each other. So men should think about their wives that way. And also, the Bible speaks about the man leaving everything he knows, his mother, his father's entire family, just to be with this person, to nurture that person. And Christ did the same thing. He, self he sacrificed himself just to nurture his church, just to bring us back to him because we had been separated. 
So if the husband should do that, then that would help in restoring the marriage or keeping the marriage strong in the Lord. Thank you very much. So what we can take away from that is that if the husband should love the wife as Christ loved the church and even gave himself for it, then submission would be a natural thing. Thank you all for sharing. We're almost out of time. So I'll just give each one. Some, someone, go ahead. Someone yes, had a point? Yes. Yes, I, I know we had mentioned um, a strong black man, but I think kind of veered off from that a little bit. But I just want to mention what a strong black man, but I have my definition. First, putting God first, as always. But also a strong black man is one that stays committed to his family. I say stay committed to a family. Every family go through difficult things. You stay committed, and, and you put God first, always work through it to get to where you want to go. Uh, and then we would also talk about women being more educated, or more educated women than men. And, and just being in field education, or used to be, you know, we, we have a lot of young black men who drop out of these high school. And the numbers are alarming. So you have more young women graduating, and more of them going on to college than you have black male. And so eventually, you know, it's going to get worse unless something changes. So we, we have to understand that aspect of it, that a lot of the black males who get into college also, um, quite a few of them become sports. And they're getting these scholarships while a lot of the uh, black males are getting academics. But we have to kind of look at the, the entire picture why you end up having eventually much more black women as far as college educated. Thank you. With black males. But I think from a Christian perspective is being committed and putting God first. Thank you very much for sharing. So what we will be taking away from your point is that a strong black man is a man that puts God's God first. Yes. Right. Thank you so much. And I'll just allow everyone just to make a final point. One final point. I just want to um, add that the matter of headship and submission, it, there's nothing negative in it from a godly standpoint. The matter of headship is more of a, a role than a titleship or a position of authority. Think about what the head does for the body. Everything balanced and in a in a in a in a homeostatic state. So the stuff that the head does in terms of producing hormones, um, cause the heartbeat to stay balanced, and all of those stuff connected to the, the, the role of what the head plays. So it's not a position of authority or a position of understanding, but it is one. Of, um, of service, and the, um, the, and the same goes for submission. It's not a position of inferiority, but it is one that's supposed to be enjoyed. So you do not want someone to you know, be um, saying all of these goals in their life and just submitting and allowing them to do it. So I just want to say, from a godly standpoint, the matter of submission and headship, they are not ones that are negative or inferior or one that Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure everyone will remember that point that we will submit ourselves one to another as we submit ourselves to Christ. And our closing point, starting with Jack. Yeah, I would just <coughs> like to say that I'm a work in progress, but I will use what I've learned here today and um, to, to commit to Vanessa and to, to, to the family to. to <laughs> To be better, I, I'm working on working on being a better husband to her. Yeah, I just think that you know, if you try to put God first in everything, you know, it would really help us to align ourselves into that mold that identifies us clearly as strong black men and women. Oh, I, I love the points that everyone said. I love what Brother Amos said about. Um, a, hus a man that is committed to the family is strong. And I completely agree because there are so many 
temptations that the black man and men in general are bombarded with and not having that good, um, much good Yes, much good examples, and also th there are just multitudes of struggles that were handed down from slavery. That you know, it causes families to be broken. So I do applaud all the men that have stood by their families and taken care of their families. I enjoy being married. I love that my kids are seeing a good example of a husband and a father. And I never had that growing up. So I'm grateful to God for the position that he has placed me in. And I really, really, really hope for more of this in our church. Thank you. Um, I grew up with um, a mother and a father. And as always, I always you know, look at them and say, that's how I want my marriage to be. And thank God. We are actually living it, you know. And I have—I was a, what do you say, a soft or a weak person when I was much, much younger. But after working at the JD for 32 years, I developed this strong personality. And so sometimes I may come off aggressive, but my husband know that I don't mean anything. So it's good when you understand each other, uh, right? So when I'm aggressive, he he gets soft. And so that makes me become soft as well. So you just understand each other, how to really relate to each other. Thank you very much. And quickly, I just want to say that um, there's no perfect marriage, because there is a point in our marriage where we had to seek counseling. OK, so it's not all nice and unky door and that, because you're going to have challenges. But you know, we saw a problem. And we said, you know, I think that we both need to seek counseling. We agreed and we went and it worked. Mm -hmm. So I, I would encourage anyone that you might be going through things, seek counseling. Don't just stay there and let this small thing become a big problem. Okay. Thank and you. that is strength right there. Thank you so much for sharing and thank you for being so real. I don't know if you could feel it, but this is one presentation that felt very authentic, very natural, very real. Nothing coming from a book or nothing cooked up because I'm one person, I don't like the super, superficial parading on a stage. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, listeners. Thanks to everyone in Zoom for being so real. And as we go through Black History Month, let us all endeavor to be our best selves. And we are all work in progress. It's not just you, Chad, all of us. We are all work in progress, and God is the head. So as we look to God, we can only get better, bigger, and stronger. And the final point that I want you to leave with is that a strong black man has a very soft heart. And that's why they were so successful. Thank you, and God bless you.